accident with my plane in the desert of Sahara six years ago. Something was broken in my engine, and as I had with me neither a mechanic nor any passengers, I set myself to attempt the difficult repairs all alone. It was a question of life or death for me. I had scarcely enough drinking water to last a week. The first night, I went to sleep on the sand, a thousand miles from any human habitation. I was more isolated than a shipwrecked sailor on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Thus you can imagine my amazement at sunrise when I was awakened by an odd little voice. It said, If you please, draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet, completely thunderstruck. I blinked my eyes hard. I looked carefully all around me, and I saw a most extraordinary small person who stood there examining me with great seriousness. Here you may see the best portrait that later I was able to make of him, but my drawing is certainly much less charming than its model. is not my fault. The grown-ups discouraged me in my painter's career when I was six years old, and I never learned to draw anything except boas from the outside and boas from the inside. Now I stared at this sudden apparition with my eyes fairly starting out of my head in astonishment.
is only his box. The sheep you asked for is inside. I was very surprised to see a light break over the face of my young judge. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think that this sheep will have to have a great deal of grass? Why? Because where I live, everything is very small. There will surely be enough grass for him, I said. It is a very small sheep that I have given you. He bent his head over the drawing. Not so small that, look, he has gone to sleep. And that is how I made the acquaintance of the little prince. Chapter 3 It took me a long time to learn where he came from. The little prince who asked me so many questions never seemed to hear the ones I asked him. It was from words dropped by chance that, little by little, everything was revealed to me. The first time he saw my airplane, for instance, I shall not draw my airplane. That would be much too complicated for me. He asked me, what is that object? That is not an object. It flies. It is an airplane. It is my airplane. And I was proud to have him learn that I could fly. He cried out then, What? You dropped down from the sky? Yes, I answered, modestly. Oh, that is funny. And the little prince broke into a lovely peal of laughter, which irritated me very much. I like my misfortunes to be taken seriously. Then he added, So you too come from the sky. Which is your planet? At that moment I got a gleam of light in the impenetrable mystery of his presence, and I demanded abruptly, Do you come from another planet? But he did not reply. He tossed his head gently, without taking his eyes from my plane. It is true that on that you can't have come from very far away. And he sank into a reverie, which lasted a long time. Then, taking my sheep out of his pocket. He buried himself in the contemplation of his treasure. You can imagine how my curiosity was aroused by this half-confidence about the other planets. I made a great effort, therefore, to find out more on this subject. My little man, where do you come from? What is this, where I live, of which you speak? Where do you want to take your sheep? After a reflective silence, he answered, The thing that is so good about the box you have given me is that at night, he can use it as his house. That is so, and if you are good, I will give you a string too, so that you can tie him during the day, and a post to tie him to. But the little prince seemed shocked by this offer. Tie him? What a queer idea. But if you don't tie him, I said, he will wander off somewhere and get lost. My friend broke into another peal of laughter. But where do you think he would go? Anywhere, straight ahead of him. Then the little prince said earnestly, That doesn't matter. Where I live, everything is so small. And with perhaps a hint of sadness, he added, Straight ahead of him, nobody can go very far. The Little Prince on Asteroid B612 I had thus learned a second fact of great importance. I'm sorry. 
Chapter 4 I had thus learned a second fact of great importance. This was that the planet the little prince came from was scarcely any larger than a house. But that did not really surprise me much. I knew very well that in addition to the great planets, such as the Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, to which we have given names, there are also hundreds of others, some of which are so small that one has a hard time seeing them through the telescope. When an astronomer discovers one of these, he does not give it a name, but only a number. He might call it, for example, Asteroid 325. I have serious reason to believe that the planet from which the little prince came is the asteroid known as B612. This asteroid has only once been seen through the telescope. That was by a Turkish astronomer in 1909. On making his discovery, the astronomer had presented it to the International Astronomical Congress in a great demonstration. But he was in Turkish costume, and so nobody would believe what he said. Grown-ups are like that. Fortunately, however, for the reputation of asteroid B612, a Turkish dictator made a law that his subjects under the pain of death. Should change to European costume. So in 1920, the astronomer gave his demonstration all over again, dressed with impressive style and elegance, and this time, everybody accepted his report. If I have told you these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you, it is on account of the grown-ups and their ways. Grown-ups love figures. When you tell them that you have made a new friend, they never ask you any questions about essential matters. They never say to you, what does his voice sound like? What games does he love best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers has he? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these figures do they think they have learned anything about him. If I were to say to the grown-ups, I saw a beautiful house made of rosy brick, with geraniums in the windows and doves on the roof, they would not be able to get any idea of that house at all. You would have to say to them, I saw a house that cost $20,000. Then they would exclaim, Oh, what a pretty house that is. So, you might say to them, the proof that the little prince existed is that he was charming, that he laughed, and that he was looking for a sheep. If anybody wants a sheep, that is a proof that he exists. And what good would it do to tell them that? They would shrug their shoulders and treat you like a child. But if you said to them, the planet he came from is asteroid B612. Then they would be convinced and leave you in peace from their questions. They are like that. One must not hold it against them. Children should always show great tolerance towards grown-up people. But certainly, for us who understand life, Figures are a matter of indifference. I should have liked to begin this story in the fashion of the fairy tales. I should have liked to say, once upon a time there was a little prince who lived on a planet that was scarcely any bigger than himself, and who had need of a sheep. To those who understand life, that would have given a much greater air of truth to my 
story. For I do not want anyone to read my book carelessly. I have suffered too much grief in setting down these memories. Six years have already passed since my friend went away from me with his sheep. If I try to describe him here, it is to make sure I shall not forget him. To forget a friend is sad. Not everyone has had a friend. And if I forget him, I may become like the grown-ups who are no longer interested in anything but figures. It is for that purpose, again, that I have bought a box of paints and some pencils. It is hard to take up drawing again at my age, when I have never made any pictures, except for those of the boa constrictor from the outside, and the boa constrictor from the inside, since I was six. I shall certainly try to make my portraits as true to life as possible, but I am not at all sure of success. One drawing goes along all right, and another has no resemblance to its subject. I make some errors, too, in the little prince's height. In one place he is too tall, and in another too short, and I feel some doubts about the color of his costume. So I fumble along as best I can, now good, now bad, and I hope generally fair to middling. In certain, more important details, I shall make mistakes also, but that is something that will not be my fault. My friend never explained anything to me. He thought perhaps that I was like himself, but I, alas, do not know how to use sheep through the walls of boxes. Perhaps I am a little like the grown-ups. I have had to grow old. As each day passed, I would learn, in our talk, something about the little prince's planet, his departure from it, his journey. The information would come very slowly, as it might chance to fall from his thoughts. It was in this way that I heard on the third day about the catastrophe of the Baobabs. This time, once more, I had the sheep to thank for it for the little prince asked me abruptly. As if seized by a grave doubt, it is true, isn't it, that sheep eat little bushes? Yes, that is true. Ah, I am glad. I did not understand why it was so important that sheep should eat little bushes. But the little prince added, then it follows that they also eat baobabs. I pointed out to the little prince that baobabs were not little bushes, but on the contrary, trees as big as castles, and that even if he took a whole herd of elephants away with him, the herd would not eat up one single baobab. The idea of the herd of elephants made the little prince laugh. We would have to put them one on top of the other, he said. But he made a wise comment. Before they grow so big, the baobabs start out by being little. That is strictly correct, I said. But why do you want the sheep to eat the little baobabs? He answered me at once. Oh, come, come as if he were speaking of something that was self-evident, and I was obliged to make a great mental effort to solve this problem without any assistance. Indeed, as I learned, there were on the planet where the little prince lived, as on all planets, good plants and bad plants. 
in the heart of the earth's darkness until someone among them is seized with the desire to awaken. Then this little seed will stretch itself and begin, timidly at first, to push a charming little sprig inoffensively upward toward the sun. If it is only a sprout of radish or the sprig of a rose bush, one would let it grow wherever it might wish. But when it is a bad plant, one must destroy it as soon as possible, the very first instant that one recognizes it. necessity. 